welcome to the Zero the Educate podcast. Everybody at Zero the had a throat infection, so I'm hosting this. My name is Pratik Singh, and I'm the founder of LearnApp.co, a video education platform where you can learn investing and trading from the leaders of the industry. Do check out LearnApp. Today we'll be talking about passive investing. You know, the first retail index fund was launched in the year 1976 by Jack Bogle. He's the founder of Vanguard. It took a while, but index funds, at least in the developed markets, have become really popular. But in spite of all this growth, and contrary to the popular narrative, passive investing is just a tiny part of the overall market. Passive investing just makes about 10% of global investable securities and only 15% in the US. In India, passive funds make about 5%, and that's like a rounding error for the total mutual fund industry. To put that into perspective, the AUM of index mutual funds is just about 6500 crores in 2019. That's not even a billion dollars. In this conversation, we'll be talking all things passive investing and index funds with Pratik Oswal, the head of passive funds with Motilal Oswal. Isn't this interesting? Pratik talking to Pratik. Hey Pratik. <laughs> hi, hi Pratik. Uh, it's always it's always good to uh, have a conversation with another Pratik. So <laughs> uh, I'm excited to to sort of do this, and uh, yeah, I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for doing this, man. Yeah. So let uh, before we start talking about passive investing, right? So tell me about yourself. How did you get involved in the markets? Yes. Um, so I've actually uh, I've actually been in the markets for quite some time. So I've been in finance for. I think almost ten years. Um, so I think I've uh, started my career in sort of more the traditional finance. So worked in investment banking, private equity, but then also actually spent the last five years in actually technology, uh, which is more of uh, more of financial technology. So my last gig, I was actually uh, working in a company in Silicon Valley where we were building solutions on passive products and then selling it to uh, investment advisors and you know so while i was doing this you know i think what i learned was passive investing is obviously great because the products themselves are extremely simple very easy to understand and very effective for investing in the long run but what i also learned is that you know there's a lot of opportunity to innovate on top of passive products you know so for example in my case what i did was i took passive products and overlaid it with uh, a strategy and sold it to advisors so that's how i've sort of been introduced to passive investing and i've i've been a huge fan you know i think the company that i was working at we scale up platform from around 40 million dollars in aum in assets to almost 450 million dollars in a year and a half so i think that was a lot of fun and uh, i i hope to you know make a similar impact uh, at motilal as well so that makes sense right that makes sense why you're the head of passive uh, index products at motilal i guess <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh, <laughs> i think um, it's it's more of the passion um, i think i'm extremely uh, i think you know in in terms of my personality also you know i believe a lot in in a lot of simplicity um i'm i'm quite a sort of zen buddhism sort of a guy so i think passive products also complement my personality which is what i what i like about them they're very simple easy to understand and i think uh, most investors i feel today or i mean i think all sophisticated investors in the us have adopted this very well and um that's that's why i think i see a lot of opportunity in this space yeah i think what what's interesting pratik so you've seen both sides now actually you've seen the us pretty well yeah. and you're looking at india now so what's the difference between the us markets and the indian markets you know um you know i think us markets are slightly ahead of india in terms of efficiency um in the sense that i think uh, indian markets are sort of so i think uh, historically you know if you looked at it the us markets were around between 15 20 years ahead of um, of the indian markets but i think that is closing down um us markets are obviously a lot bigger uh, and more much more i think the number of large cap companies out there uh, the number of just uh, mega size companies a lot more so for example you know i think in india the top 100 companies are large caps whereas in the us the top 500 companies are all large cap stocks you know so i think the the market is a lot deeper it's a lot more efficient there's a lot more bigger companies in that space and there's also a lot of lot more trading activity happening in the us market so you know i think uh, which 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 makes sense because you know it's a much bigger country as an economy it's i think five or six times india's gdp so i think uh, it's always good to know you know where we're headed as a market so i think that experience out there was super valuable uh and 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 i think uh, from the way you know i think just the us markets have performed despite 
uh, being a very efficient economy, um, uh, I think it, I think the, it's precedent that you know, Indian markets will sort of go the same way. Correct. Uh, and I think I understand why you came back to India to run the business because India, you probably see what potential India has over the next decade, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think opportunity is sort of immense. You know, I have seen it. So I think I've been investing for a, for a very long time. You know, my family's been investing for 30 or 30 odd years. And, you know, what we've seen is just, I mean, uh, the growth opportunity that has happened in India versus where we're headed is is huge, and I think uh, anyone who's looking to participate in the equity markets today is is going to be super happy. If if obviously you know, I think the only challenges is behavioral, that markets are obviously a little bit risky in the short term. So what I say is that you know risk is short term, return is long term. You know, so if you're if you're able to you know sort of ride the cycles of short termism then i think you can be you'll be very happy with what sort of returns you get in the future cool yeah so for the unish, uninitiated who's listening to this um, let's just do a quick uh, a quick one one line so what are passive funds what do they track so one sentence uh, passive funds are funds that track the returns of an index or a benchmark um, so by index or a benchmark i think um, a nifty or a sensex would be an example of an index and uh, Ideally, the, the Nifty, if you were investing in a fund that, that is replicating the Nifty, the Nifty goes up by 10%, you go up by 10%. So you're just purely replicating the returns of the benchmark. Right, perfect. So I think that makes sense. And uh, you also probably want to explain what the expense ratio is. Is it cheaper than an actively managed fund and, and why? Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of cost associated with active funds. You know, you have to have, uh, I think, um, you, you have to have fund managers and you have to have a philosophy and I think uh, the reason why active uh, passive funds are preferred by some subset of customers is because of the cost aspect you know I think passive funds are today I would say in the US and also in India you know I think one fifth to one tenth the price of an active fund so if you're looking at maybe one half two percent in expense ratio uh, and this is obviously in a direct plan you're looking at uh, one fifth of that in a passive fund. So I think costs are extremely important. And the reason why costs are important is that I think you mentioned Jack Bogle. You know, I'm a big fan of Jack, Jack Bogle. And what he said is that, you know, I think the guys who, who've ended up, you know, creating wealth over very long periods have guys who have focused on cost and on discipline. You know, and passive funds make sure that they're focusing on cost. Yeah. And also he took something very simple and just scaled the heck out of it. And it worked. Right. I mean, Vanguard that way has done amazingly well. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think Vanguard started in 1976. You know, this is almost 45 years ago. And they launched uh, the S&P 500, which is basically the top 500 stocks in the US. And uh, just, just imagine, you know, this, you launched something in 45 years ago, you survived. And today the S&P 500 is actually the largest and the most traded index in the world. You know, you're looking at 800 trillion, trillions of dollars that have been traded on the S&P 500. So, you know, I think what we've seen is that, you know, um, number one, simplicity works. So a simple product works better than a complex product. And number two, you know, I think these products have stood the test of time. So in those 45 years, for example, uh, I would say two thirds or maybe three fourths of all active funds have either closed down or merged and maybe one or two have outperformed the benchmark uh, by say um, by one or more percent. So I think uh, um, I think over really long time periods, you know, you're really sort of um, creating a lot of wealth through passive funds. Yeah. And, and to think about it, to put this in perspective, like I just did a Google search, right? August 31st, 2019, Vanguard is managing 5.6 trillion. I mean, that's, I think, what Pratik was talking about. So if it's simple, think about WhatsApp, right? How simple the product is. They were able to scale it so well and it works. Um, so, so now that we've, we've talked about uh, the passive uh, world, uh, Pratik, let's talk about Motilal as well, right? So this isn't the first time Motilal is actually launching an index fund. You guys actually had a passive fund in 2010. So what changed till, uh, since then? And what do you, why do you think you will actually succeed now in 2019? So, so great question. So actually, you know, most people don't know this, but we've actually been in the passive investing space for almost a decade now. Um, so we actually launched uh, India's first ETF. So India's first uh, smart beta ETF. It was called the uh, Most 50 Remixed. Uh, by Remixed, I mean, you know, you take the Nifty 50 and you change the weightages. And um, I think it was a smart beta product. And uh, we launched in 2010 and actually did decently well. We got good uh, sort of coverage in AUMs. But I think, you know, what we realized is that back then, the knowledge of uh, what people had about passives was quite low. I think, uh, you know, even though this is a passive product, you know, we kept getting phone calls, you know, from people asking us, who's your fund manager? You know, why is he buying this stock? 
um, you know, I mean, and, and it's very hard for us to say that, boss, you know, there is no fund manager and there's, we have, we have this algorithm that's sort of driving all decision making. So I think um, knowledge was less, uh, I would, I'll be honest. And that's why I sort of, we sort of pivoted to uh, an active strategy, which has obviously done pretty well. It's more core to our beliefs. And um, I think this, so this is our, this is our second attempt towards passives. Um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, I mean, I know you've probably, People have probably asked you this question like a thousand times. Yeah. But every time I take the flight and land in Mumbai or any other airport, I see like this Motilal ad, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. probably look at it and smile as well. Yeah. And it says, yeah. it says, buy right, sit tight. So like active is like the part of your DNA, right? So that's right. Uh, I know you've been in passive for a long time, but it feels like you're more aggressive now in passive. I can say that. So uh, why is that? Yeah, so I think so. Our DNA, obviously, as you said, is is active investing, is research, it's stock picking, and I think that is our probably. I mean, still, I would say, biggest strength, and it will continue to be be a big strength going forward too. Uh, I mean, I am obviously, I mean, uh, very committed and to the AMC, and but but I think you know, I think the how we see this as you know, every portfolio needs some element of simplicity. You know, so I'll give you my own example. You know, so I. Uh, when I was managing money for really wealthy people in the US, you know what, and these guys are like, you know, I mean, 25, 30 million dollars plus in assets, super rich, you know, these guys are like relatively older folks. And you know, what I, what I saw, and these guys have obviously adopted, uh, adopted passive funds for say like 10, 20, 30 years. And what I saw was that, you know, like if passive one or if active one, you would have 100% portfolio in active or 100% portfolio in passive. But, you know, the reality is that, you know, almost everyone had a combination of both. They had a combination of some act active, some passive. So I think what we've seen is that, you know, I think every portfolio uh, needs uh, an element of simplicity. And that's where passive comes in. And I think for extremely long time periods, as I said, you know, I think the, the beauty about passive is not about the returns. It's about the risk and it's about it's it's about longevity. So if you're looking to invest for say 10 years plus, if you're like 25, 30, 35 rolls, you have a very long career, you're looking to invest for retirement. So it makes sense to have some portfolio where you know, you're know you sort of hedged from a lot of these short-term things that happen with active fund managers. So I think, um, yeah, and also, you know, I think most people don't realize this, but you know, um, I mean, just to be like super sort of direct uh, is that you know, a lot of the mutual fund industry today you know, a lot of funds that I've seen today, and, and this is from my obviously very uh, sort of small time in the space, uh, that like like a lot of them are, like the funds that we have are sort of typically benchmark huggers. By benchmark huggers, I mean, you know, I think most funds do that 1% up, 1% down sort of performance. Right. Oh, wow. I can't believe you're saying this. I, I really appreciate your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's, it's just that there's, I mean, and, and I think uh, that is something that, uh, so in the US, they call this alpha core. And these funds have actually uh, haven't sort of, uh, because when you think about it, you know, a lot of these funds are, you're looking at, you know, two and a half percent expense ratio, they keep a cash call of five to 10 percent, and then you have a lot of churning as well. So I think a fund manager in those funds has to, not now, but hence, uh, from even now in the future, has to outperform it by three to four percent just to match the benchmark, which I think will get harder over time. So, and, and if you see all of uh, Motidal Oswal's funds or, you know, all our, all our strategies, we're actually very focused. You know, all our strategies like very like focused 25, 35, very concentrated portfolios where, you know, I think, uh, I mean, our investors have seen this, that when we do outperform, we outperform like crazy and we are underperforming. So we call ourselves benchmark agnostic. So if we have a bearish call on IT, you know, we're more than happy to take a 0% exposure on IT, which I think a lot of people won't be able to. So I think, uh, so, so, and, and, and so I think that's where sort of we fit in. We, we see ourselves as pure alpha seekers. And we see ourselves, obviously, now we're building a business that's focused on just pure beta. Yeah, you talked about churn, that active has some bit of churn and some of them have a lot of churn. Yeah. Uh, but even the constituents of the benchmark itself also change, right? So is that something to worry about, something to think about? Uh, why does that happen? How does the investor see that? So the constituents of the benchmark, the it changing is actually, you know, the most beautiful thing. And it's the best part about passive investing. <laughs> it's literally why passive investing yeah. works. You know, if you think about it, you know, in 2005, just take back 2005, you know, you're looking at the Nifty 50, which is a top 50 index. You know, most people, most people don't know this, but Nifty 50 was not financial services heavy. It used to be industrials, infrastructure, you know, utilities, oil and gas. Whereas today it's financial services, 35% plus, and tomorrow it might be something else. Correct. So actually what's protecting investors is the fact that the benchmark changes every, say, five to 10 years time. 
you know you make sure that you always have the best quality or the best like the top stocks in india will always be in your portfolio regardless of what happens you know so a lot of stocks who haven't gone back which haven't gone back to the highs in 2008 you know a lot of them actually haven't uh, gone back to the highs today also but the benchmark has has i would say gone up two and a half times since then so i think uh, passive investing rate because you know it's 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 i would say um it's very um, it follows darwinism you know which is survival of the fittest and it it sort of adapts to changing conditions so you can make sure that if you hold a passive fund today you will hold the best 50 yeah. or top 50 or top 100 whatever it is even in the future yeah i was actually going to ask you this question but you sort of already quasi answered it what i was going to really ask is an index fund is not created with any fundamentals in mind right that's the point so there's no bias absolutely so, right there's no bias created on liquidity or market cap or something like that right and uh, that may cause some bad companies to just pop in right like the yes bank may pop in like the vakrangi may pop in um so isn't that a bad thing because you know there's no fundamental involved doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of indexing uh, that these guys may just pop up or is that just part of the game yeah so you know i think uh, so most i would say that these are simple passive funds are, are weighted weighted by size so by size i mean the bigger stocks get more weightage the smaller stocks get less weightage yeah market cap weighted and that's how i would say most of the simple passive funds are structured and i completely agree you know i mean i think when looking at a passive fund you will have like for example the next 50 uh, the nifty next 50 which is um you know stock number 51 to 100 had guys like dhfl india bulls which sort of pulled down the returns so i think that is going to happen uh, but the beauty about it is that you know it will get kicked out of the index eventually you know so i think the index is very brutal the index does not uh have i mean it doesn't have any sympathy for you so a company that does not deliver will be kicked out of the index very soon and a company that does deliver will get upgraded very soon so basically you can expect that so i think what happens in the active space is you know a lot of people tend to uh chase returns you know chasing returns is like big phenomena um i i think and but, but in passive you know you're making sure that you know whenever something does well it's automatically going up the order Uh, and your sort of weightage in that keeps on going up over yeah and i've also seen like the companies that get discarded that are moved away from the index suddenly the liquidity also drops um and if some company just joins the then the liquidity just goes up so clearly people are following the index like much more than this you know look in the past mirror ki oh this was a bad company but they will be weeded out eventually so i think that makes total sense so it's even more reason to do index invest <laughs> i guess yeah exactly so i think and 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 just to add to the point you know the index you know is actually quite diversified you know you're looking at 50 100 200 500 stocks so one or two bad apples will not really make a big difference to your portfolio um and 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 by the time the bad apple makes a difference it gets smaller and smaller and more insignificant over time so i think uh, that is something that investors shouldn't worry if obviously they're looking for long term investing you know if someone's looking to Correct. and eventually people go satyam satyam who i don't know that yeah company. exactly <laughs> so it is yeah yeah <laughs> what <laughs> yeah so no cool yeah exactly and i mean you know i think we've seen so we've been running passive funds you know we've had gitanjali gems you know that has comp- like uh, that was in the mid cap index and it got thrown out um so yeah i think we've sort of seen that and honestly the the index hasn't really suffered um overall because of how small or how insignificant it becomes as it sort of loses value so yeah so i, I think uh, the stocks that go up um uh, are actually good for the investor and actually they increase in value so i think that is i think that's entire sort of uh, the methodology of you know how they how those stocks move inside make gives a lot of credibility yeah yeah stuff. you know one thing i really wanted to uh, understand from you right so basically what the manager is doing uh, not the manager the person who's looking after the index fund he's taking the money he's uh, distributing it according to the weightage of the index he's tracking and basically from that he takes a very small expense ratio and, and that's what he keeps Um, now this expense ratio is much lesser than the active funds like you told me earlier but a few basis points does that really matter prati can you explain to our listeners how much of a difference this can actually make um you mean expense ratio yeah so in exp- yeah so you know expense ratio is uh, you know i think uh, i think it's a very important thing to understand that expense ratio uh, does not matter if you're doing it say for one or two or three years time but if someone is really investing for a really long time so suppose a, a relatively young investor who's say 25 30 35 is entering the market today 
and wants to invest for a very long time, then he needs to think about expense ratio because that 1% adds up into something that become quite significant over time. Just, just imagine, you know, you're, you're paying 1% every year for say 30 years. You know, that, that becomes half your portfolio over time. You know, so I think uh, expenses is important. You know, having said that, and I the compounding th- effect also is affected. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, so thirty percent plus compounding will be like I don't know, forty, forty-five, maybe fifty percent. Um, so I think, yeah, so I, I think expenses are important, uh, and I think um, uh, you should have some part of a portfolio that is in sort of low-cost funds. Yeah, you know, there's. I, I'll jump to a different topic completely now. So um, there's one misconception, Pratik, that index funds don't offer downside, like. What retailers hear all the time is, oh, debt will give you downside uh, cushioning if the market goes down, right? And active funds also say that a lot. So how do you respond to that? I mean, index doesn't have debt, obviously. It's pure equity. So what does that really mean? No, so I think index funds are exactly like active. I mean, they're exactly the same. You know, that, So, you know, I think there's... Uh, so the way I see it, the mutual fund ads come and you have this guy in the, in the end saying index funds are uh, subject to market risk. You know, that is literally the definition of an index fund. You know, that literally because because an active fund is subject to market risk as well as a fund manager risk. You know, so a combination of two, whereas index funds are pure market risk. And the reason why that is absolutely great is because you know who to point fingers to, which is the market. And the market, as you know, is volatile. You know, so I think the beauty about, you know, as you said, um, obviously, yeah, I mean, in the index funds are just like active funds. So they ca- could be more volatile, they could be less volatile than active funds. It depends on what the strategy you're comparing it to. But, uh, you know, just, just, to, just to let you know that, you know, most investors today, I think a good proportion of them, you know, I think churning of portfolio is, 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 is a bit of an issue. And the number one reason to why people churn their portfolio is underperformance. And the second one is capital loss. So with index funds, you know, you don't really have that underperformance happening in your portfolio. So there's not really a need to churn the portfolio. So I think uh, it's much more stress-free and uh, which is why I think, you know, sort of keeping on to the cycles or holding on to investments for say 10, 15 years is much easier than it is say for an active fund where you may underperform, you may not. You know, so I think that is why I think managing the psychology of investor, uh, which I think is key for long-term investing, is is relatively less difficult with index. Fund. And I think uh, I think uh, we should also talk about risk. Yeah, we should. You know, so as you know, so yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett. You know, I've gone to Omaha, I've I've, I've seen him speak there. Oh, really? Think, um, At his pre- yeah, yeah, that wow. was. Yeah, I think I, I think every investor, you know, who's sort of passionate about investing should really like think about, you know, making a pilgrimage to Omaha <laughs> because it's such an incredible the experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a pilgrimage. It's, it's it's the environment is absolutely crazy. It's not very hard to sort of, you know, get a ticket to go there. And I think uh, I mean if you think and, and I think if you think about it, you know, it's it sounds like the most boring thing in the world. It's like two old guys just talking for ten hours. But uh, they really, really do captivate your attention. So I think uh, a huge learning opportunity. Obviously, you know, you can live see it live stream on Google. But I think seeing them in person is a very different. But anyway, so, the, so coming back to uh, the point that, you know, so Warren Buffett uh, learned. Um, so he studied un- under this guy called uh, Benjamin Graham, which who wrote this really nice book called The Intelligent Investor. Uh, which uh, yeah, very hard read, by the way, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. But I feel like you know, every time you read, you read, uh, you learn something new. So you know, I think <laughs> people who have read it should ideally, you know, look at so just 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 read it again because I think it's a very it's packed with a lot of uh, simplicity and a lot of good insights. And uh, and one of the insights in the book is, uh, is is sort of targeted towards the advisor, saying that you know the advisor's job is not to manage return; it's to manage risk. You know, because returns, as you've seen, you know, mutual fund space, it's very volatile. You know, back in like five years ago, you know, advisors sold you on 15 to 20 percent. Today is 10 to 12 percent. In the future, who knows what will happen, you know. But, you know, risk is actually quite consistent. You know, as investors, we need to think about what risk we're taking. Because if you just do uh, sort by return, you'll end up buying small cap stocks, small cap funds, which are extremely risky, you know. So I think risk is something that's extremely important, and uh, index funds are great because the because what I've for what we've seen by data is risk is actually quite consistent. So an index fund risk today versus the risk ten years ago has been exactly the same. Whereas an active fund, the ranges are massive. You can have an active fund that is having a standard deviation of six percent. You can have an active fund that has standard deviation of twenty percent. You know, and that so you might hold an active fund, but you actually or, or 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 like a large cap fund, but you might hold the risk of a small cap fund. 
So, you know, so I think obviously this will go down over time. But so now SEBI has come up with certain policies, but I think still I think so risk is is, is quite consistent. Which I think knowing your risk is much better. And secondly, you know, I think um, investors, you know, so people you know what i've seen is that i would say 80 90% of the people today are focused a lot of like a lot of the energies is towards fund selection you know by fund selection i mean they have to decide which fund to buy which fund to sell which fund to churn yeah and, basically know, strategy what, right they think yeah, more strategy yeah. rather than allocation exactly absolutely more strategy as you know which this fund will this fund give me more returns than that fund you know how will i be the benchmark and all that but the reality is that you know i think uh, what what i think uh, studies or numerous studies have shown that actually long term returns does not come from which fund you buy or sell it's actually come from the combination of those funds and that is called asset allocation you know so i think uh, investors need to understand that they need to they need to have the nice the, the right combination which will so for example a risk averse investor might have a higher debt allocation higher large cap allocation whereas a risk a uh, loving investor you know who wants to sort of make more returns should i really have a more say mid or small cap or whatever so i think that is something what kind of allocation would you do for this so depends on uh, the investor you know the allocation no for your money like if you had to do it for your money what would your allocation be so um, so in terms of my allocation you know i mean i would definitely have so i have a long way to go so i have maybe 30 40 year career in front of me so i would definitely have i would say maybe 40 maybe 50% of money in and passive funds and the rest i would probably you know do it in active funds or debt all of that yeah yeah so i think i mean currently you know i'll be honest i mean most of my money is mostly the active funds and the reason that is because you know i think i am biased you know and 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 i know and i understand the group's philosophy and i am fully on board with it and you know i know for a fact that you know i think active funds do well only problem is that most of us don't have the mental capacity to hold on to underperformance too long so i think uh, I, I definitely feel, um, in terms of allocations, you know, the younger you are, more passive. The more risk averse you are, I would say, more passive. So you have the Nifty 500 uh, index fund. You have the mid cap 150, and I see the small cap 250 index, right? Now, uh, as far as my understanding goes, the liquidity dries up maybe in the top 80, top 100 stocks, right? Beyond that, the liquidity starts um, starts to widen. So the bid ask will widen and. liquidity is a challenge so how do you deal with that as a fund house like when money flows in how do you how do you actually replicate the index then yeah so um so i mean you're absolutely right um liquidity does dry up in india and i think uh, um especially post say the 200 or 250 stock you know there is uh, less liquidity than there would be in the top 100 stocks but you know i know i, I mean if you look at the nifty 500 you know that is literally the one fund that is that offers you equity as an asset class you know buying india's equity it's it's like buying gold buying equity would mean nifty 500 because you're buying 96 97% of india's market cap so i think uh, and and if you just look at the nifty 500 you're not actually buying 500 stocks you know 85% or 82 1/2% is actually the top 100 stocks 15% is a mid cap and just like maybe less than 4% is a small cap index. So the reason the so I think uh, liquidity is not a challenge at all because you're basically buying because they're not equal. Not, exactly. And I mean a equal weight index would be uh, <laughs> would be a huge challenge. That would be impossible. Not impossible, that would be hard to scale up, but I think this is more of a market cap. So I think uh, because of the way the index is structured, the top guys, the guys with the most liquidity, the most uh, sizes get maximum sort of Uh, weightages so i think uh, that so and and we you know on, i'll be honest we've done we've done back testing you know we we've studied the liquidity before doing this you know and uh, we've also had experts and i think what we've seen is that you know i think um, uh, barring the small cap index you know all all other indexes are actually you know scalable uh, with the small cap index you know um, obviously the liquidity the, the the top 50 stocks is 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 scarce if you had say a 5000 or 6000 crore fund but i think uh, at our size today i think uh, we w- we we, do, we don't have any problems number one and number two you know i think uh, if you think about it you know people had the same issues with the mid cap index 10 years ago you know so i think hopefully the india india as as we go will become more liquid there'll be more trading activity there'll be more investors there'll be more buying and selling so i think if we account for all that so it'll only get better exactly it'll only get better So I think uh, we're we're seeing this from a bit of a medium to long term um, sort of opportunity. One more question about the mechanism of the fund house, okay? So this is uh, a question on how you actually manage the money. So let's suppose there was this 2008 situation where suddenly, you know, like there's a run on the bank, there's a run on uh, a particular fund. <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen, but let's suppose it does. 
and there are lots of redemptions, right? Uh, so how do you actually exit those stock, especially towards the tail end, you know? The, is that very difficult to do? Yeah, no. So so basically, you know, that's the beauty. <clears throat> so, you know, when you, when you think of passive funds, yeah. there's two sort of formats. One is the ETF and one is the index fund. Okay. And uh, ETFs are something that you have to exit right away. You know, so if you get a sell order, you have to execute in the next 15 minutes. Okay. Whereas index funds, you know, you have a day and a half to sell all those, all your securities. Oh. You know, so um, so so it's basically T plus three, which is transaction day plus three days, is when I have to return my money back to investors. Yeah. So in most, I would say 99% of the cases, I will do it um, in the last half an hour of trading, you know, which to to get the end of day sort of price. But in certain cases, I could also do it the next day. And uh, you know, in terms of liquidity, I can give an example. You know, so we have a ETF called the Midcap 100 ETF, um, which we've been running for the last eight years. And we've had investors who had bought and sold, you know, 150, 100, 100 150 crore worth of uh, stock, like just like on one day, and then buying or the other. So I think we we have seen these are individuals or institutions. Uh, these are institutions. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. So we've seen that, and we managed to, and and also we we've learned from experience that. Uh, so we have had good six seven years experience, and so right now it's completely automated. <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, I think um, um, liquidity at at the current sort of market cap that uh, size of funds we have is not an issue. And I mean we don't see an issue in terms of liquidity because we have time for us to sort of go there and sell it. Yeah, this is, if it's completely automated, this is a really good business as well because not only are you saving money for the customer. I mean, it almost costs nothing to actually run it, right? That's that's pretty good. It's a win-win for both. Yeah, so the ETFs are automated, almost automated, I would say. There is some small human intervention, but yeah, the index funds are not yet because we're sort of still learning and and uh, hopefully, you know, <laughs> this time next year, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, sort of automated that. But, but also, I think automation has its challenges because, you know, the idea is to lower the cost of trading as much as you can. So I think uh, I, my, my plan is to not uh, accept the current cost of automation is to lower it down. So hopefully we can make our models uh, better and more efficient. Yeah, I think your experience in tech will really help you. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think uh, we're trying to use uh, as much technology as we can to lower the cost of trading, because I think that if you lower the cost of trading, you know, the, all the benefits, so our, uh, all the benefits actually goes to the investor, not to us, because all we stand to make is the expense ratio, uh, whereas everything else goes back to the investor. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit more active versus passive. So one of the heated debates I've seen a lot, as, at least lately, people are talking a lot about active versus passive. So give me the lowdown. What are people really uh, fighting about? Is it the investment returns or is it just the difference in cost? I mean, what are they, what's the debate really about? I think I think cost is not as big, a, big an issue as it is about returns. You know, I think uh, investors... You know, I mean, if you think about it, you know, there are higher cost uh, funds or higher cost uh, structures that are being sold today. And I think, the, um, you know, the financial services industry is is ideally a seller of hope in the hope that you make uh, like a lot of money. And which is why I think fees are, I mean, fees make sense, right? I mean, you do, most investors do end up making more money in like, uh, in, in, in stuff like private equity or whatever. So I think it makes sense to charge more. But I think uh, people are today are more about the return aspect. You know, I think... Uh, um, index uh, is not something that most people sort of compare their investments to and still it, uh, I still think it's it's sort of at a nascent stage today uh, but but I think uh, especially in the last three to four years you know you've seen that a lot of active fund managers have not managed to sort of uh, or actually in, in um, managed to outperform or the, the benchmark which uh, which is which is which is why you know so the theory is that you know if you can't outperform the benchmark then just buy the benchmark for free right so I think people are starting to ask questions that, you know, should I even give money or should I even, you know, allocate some of my money to sort of active funds because number one, I'm paying more and number two, I'm not even getting the returns that I can do it for free or for very low cost. So so that is a conversation and, and that's a conversation that, you know, people have been having globally for, I don't know, 20, 30 years now. <laughs> and it still happens, man. I mean, even if, if the, like the mutual fund industry today in the US is like 55% passive, you still have like, oh, I, I mean, everyone's still debating, you know, people are calling passive uh, investing as a bubble, people saying active investing doesn't work. So I think, you know, from what I know, you know, honestly, I don't, don't want to even get into this active versus passive debate, because I think that the way I see it, you know, passive is good as passive is, there for simplicity, 
more than anything else Haan. you know so the way the, the, and dono samajh lo and then choose cho- choose what you like and mix and match yeah exactly <laughs> that's a good exactly. solution I, the, yeah so i i don't know i'll be honest like why to be so pol- polarized yeah right? yeah so so i think uh, it's 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 a lot of intellectuals and 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 i do agree like you know philosophically if you, uh, it, it makes sense because the market tends to be so i mean the the underlying theory to why passive funds make sense is that you know collective wisdom uh, is better than individual wisdom you know so the market is uh, a place where you have hundreds of thousands of people trying to look for mispricings trying to create alpha and if you combine all of them you know and then it becomes very hard because all of them are undercutting each other they find mispricing before all of that so you as an individual you know trying to create that becomes very hard in a market where you know everything's priced in i, I think that's the philosophy but you know i think uh, uh, and which which makes perfect sense especially in a, a market like us where things are a lot more efficient but i feel like in india i think the efficiency is still not there yet you know in my opinion you know so especially in like the small cap space or even mid cap or maybe in the last cap space you know there are opportunities where you could sort of you know pick the right stocks all of that so i think and and it also depends on size you know so managing a 10 crore portfolio versus a 100000 or 10000 crore portfolio is very different you know so your ability to be flexible is actually much easier in a 10 crore versus and so i think uh, i think uh, and and as we see mutual funds growing from say today 10 lakh crore in aum to 30 40 lakh crore you know it will get incrementally harder and harder to you to deliver out performance or alpha i mean whatever you call it um so the snp indices versus active uh, is a report uh, called spiva as you already know um and it basically measures the performance of actively managed f- uh, funds versus their snp index benchmarks uh, in india obviously has this partnership so all the indices we have it says snp nifty right so Uh, it basically will compare uh, nifty that's the benchmark against the active fund now if you look at the scorecard uh, and this is for our listeners uh, pratik obviously already knows and talks about this if you go back as 2010 over 60% of funds especially in the large cap ca- category didn't beat the benchmark that's the index so the question to you pratik is is picking a good active fund pretty much a coin toss or is there some skill involved no i think uh, what we realize is that it is it is a bit of a coin toss and i think in addition to the coin toss you know i think um, people need to understand that you know even the guys who end up beating a benchmark you know will underperform because i think getting consistent outperformance in a fund is virtually impossible you know so funds will so suppose an active fund is doing a value strategy or a growth strategy you know that strategy will work in a different a uh, different sort of a market you know so value might work today you know growth might do badly today you know so i think what we've learned is that you know i think consistent alpha is is something that you know you should never expect in a mutual fund that is number one number two i think you know there is there is credibility in a philosophy you know so i think uh, if you look at active funds even though they might not be consistently underperforming you know there will be like they go through cycles where they will underperform today outperform tomorrow they'll underperform again so i think investors are looking to active funds you know should idly expect them to you know i think be really really sure about the philosophy of the fund manager about the fund house about what they're trying to do and they should idly not look for returns but look at their conviction of the fund manager philosophy you know so like like the spiva report for example you know i i i mean obviously that's a great report it talks about uh, it tells you that you know I, I, and and honestly a spiva report is also not completely right there's no survivorship bias so i'll give an example the spiva report in the us says that you know 90% of passive funds or uh, active funds have underperformed the benchmark it's actually much more than that because a lot of funds have shut down or merged over the last 10 years so the actual number is more like 90 95 96 96 maybe who knows yeah so so you know i think the us uh, is is a is, is i think that market is very efficient and even in india i think the efficiency is getting there um, but but you know in in my opinion i think investors should uh, spend a little bit more time then just looking at 3 to 5 year returns uh to be able to you know like pick the right fund or right the fund manager i think there is more to do more than that um because you know what we've seen is that 3 to 5 year returns is not a very good metric to figure out the next 3 to 5 years in fact you know it might be the opposite you know it might be that uh, uh there there's some there's a, there's a term called mean reversion 
basically what it, what it means is that the funds that end up doing really well in the last five years will most probably exactly will come back to the mean will come back to the market rate so i think uh, investors need to sort of just be a little bit wary of that and make decisions accordingly wow so good performing funds could just be a blip That's yeah it, 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 you know i mean there are cycles right there's cycle for growth there's like like the cycle for value yeah. today's cycle for quality Correct. if you hold if you held any of the top 10 stocks in your portfolio or if you held a lot of cash you know if you've taken a call of holding cash now your fund would have done well so i think uh, people need to understand go beyond just the returns to understand uh, what's happening yeah yeah a, a little bit more i'm going to move away from this and talk about again as an amc as a business because i really want to understand how the amc also functions and i think the listeners also want to know so uh, a lot of how financial services works is a lot of these products are sold by distributors uh, or advisors right and they do a fantastic job i mean they would go to each person they would advise it's just amazing uh, but one question I had is that since index funds can't afford to pay high commissions, I mean, how will you actually grow this market? Um, how does that? How, what's the strategy? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. So that's that's I think one of the um, sort of obstacles, you know, for you to grow this business is that you know you have to go direct to the customer, and uh, the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 no. Honestly, honestly, you know, I spend like. I would say like 70, maybe 60, 70 percent of, of my time just in education, just going out there, doing seminars, trying to present about passive funds, trying to make people understand what passive funds are and how they can analyze your portfolio. So I think uh, the education awareness is what I'm spending, I would say, most of my time and the rest on like businessy sort of a, sort of stuff. And I think uh, I, I think the first barrier is number one education. The second barrier is the ecosystem, which you pointed out. You know, which is I think, uh, um, how do you sell this stuff? You know, because you can't go through intermediaries. You know, no one. I, I mean, we we had uh, so we've done an NFO uh, of four funds last month, and we've had very little traction with distributors because obviously the commission, uh, which is embedded, is, is and quite and it makes little. sense. I mean, they should be paid for their uh, their hard work. Exactly, exactly, sense. exactly. So you know, I think uh, the battle is number one. You know, so I am not. So, you know, as I said before, financial services is about, you know, like a lot about selling hope. So in my case, you know, in my case, I am not giving commission and I'm not selling hope, you know, <laughs> whereas in an active fund, you know, there's commission and there's hope of making a lot of money. So, so I think uh, there's, there, are, there are sort of two uh, sides to this. And, uh, but, but, you know, I'll be honest, I think um, as, as customers are getting smarter and smarter, as customers are better at Googling stuff out, you know, they are... Uh, uh, I would say, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think I think there are. So, for example, in our case, you know, I think the maximum uptake happened in the retail investor uh, sort of segment, uh, which I think is very, very encouraging. It's, it me it shows that, you know, people are getting smarter, people are getting more aware of this stuff, of these products. Whereas I think hopefully over time, you know, we will get more sort of participation from institutional or H&I or tri H&I that category. Yeah, yeah. You know what would be cool? Yeah. Like in 2030, people listening to the podcast and saying, damn man, 1 lakh crore is, is already AUM under passive funds. It was just under a billion 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that would be pretty interesting if that actually yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah. No, and honestly, it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think uh, uh, there is uh, like already we're seeing, we're seeing, I think so. I think you know, one big kicker or at least one big opportunity that we see at least with intermediaries is you know upcoming i think so what's happening in india today is a lot of distributors who were traditional distributors who used to you know basically get commission through amcs are now becoming uh, investment advisors so fee only investment advisors so basically what that means is that you know you are getting you're basically making or you're, you're making your income via charging a fee to your customer so you're basically giving your customer direct plans and everything but you're charging you're making your money to the customer which i think which is yeah. what the dominant like an advisory fee, exactly right? advisory yeah, fee. Is, yeah so they know they're paying for this versus that absolutely so i think that's where i think you know uh, that's where i think i would say i see a lot of opportunity at least in the intermediary space because someone who's paying fee understands the value of passive of what it can you know sort of the value it can bring to your portfolio of a customer you know i don't have to worry about underperformance i don't have to worry about managing psychology of the investor all of that so i think uh, that trend will hopefully emerge you know i, I mean hopefully and yeah. that happens. i think you're right i think people will pay for, for for advice because when someone's investing like half their life savings they want good advice so i, I don't see why they wouldn't pay but yeah something that's upcoming you're totally right yes yes yeah so that's that's a big driver you, earlier pratik you you mentioned something on smart peter earlier yes that you actually 
uh, one of the first com- uh, first AMC's to actually launch a smart yeah. fund, yeah. which uh, I don't think anyone did at that time. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. Please go. Uh, so, sorry. The question was: So, what what type of a fund was it, and why did you close? And also, very quickly, explain what smart beta means for our listeners. Yes. Yes. So, smart beta is uh, is becoming, uh, or or I think it has become. Um, a bit of a buzzword, um, especially in India, but I think globally. Um, the, the, so how smart beta is different from, say, so smart beta is still passive. You know, it comes under passive funds, but the only difference is that you know, in in, in sort of low cost or simple passive funds, your objective is to match the benchmark or hug the benchmark as closely as possible, so give you benchmark returns. Whereas smart beta, actually, the mandate is to have low cost, but also the ability to beat the benchmark over time. So you get the best of both worlds. You know, you get so it's smartly weighted. Yeah, so smartly weighted. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So basically, you would change the weightages of the fund, or you would choose say twenty out of the fifty, or you know, fifty out of the hundred through some sort of uh, algorithm or some automated trading strategy. Uh, but the idea is very simple: is to beat the benchmark, and uh, that's that's basically where Smart Beta came in. You know, and 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 globally, it hasn't worked. You know, I'll be honest. Um, Smart Beta is a very interesting concept. I I think it's a huge opportunity. But uh, from our experience, you know, I, I mean, I I remember telling you that, uh, that you know we had customers calling us asking us who the fund manager is, and uh, I'll I'll give you one other example that you know. So I know I knew actually a fund in the U.S. Uh, or one of my friends who was working on a fund where. Um, Where you know they wanted to create the smart beta strategy, and the problem is that you know the top two stocks uh, that the smart beta strategy threw up were like something equivalent to an India Bulls or a DHFL sort of a thing. So you know that is something that and 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 you can't really do something about it, right? When it happens, I mean you can't change the strategy based on what it throws up. So I think uh, that's why I think you know I think uh, smart beta is definitely an opportunity, but uh, I think the education towards uh, just pure passive funds is very less. And once you know you see a lot of people sort of um, uh, adopting passive, then you can see people adopting smart beta. Uh, but even then, you know, I think the AUMs of smart beta are still quite low globally. Yeah, I mean, uh, also I, I was just thinking for the listener who's been listening for this for almost an hour now. I mean, well done. <laughs> you, you, you got through this for an hour, <laughs> so here's a little prize. <laughs> I know that's with Pratik that I have here, like. I'm sure you want to know about ETFs. And yeah, I mean, uh, and and this that's why you've got got this far. So yeah, if Pratik, if can you please explain uh, yeah. if someone wants to. Yeah, ETF, I mean, if if you can if you can hang out for 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 maybe some more time, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to you in person. You know, <laughs> you know, that's a huge it's achievement. It's not education. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll uh, open my so, yeah. So, so Pratik, if someone wants to do this, uh, can you explain how the core satellite portfolio works? If I want to construct a portfolio with uh, with with an index fund. Yes, I would refrain from telling someone to put all their money in passive funds, like hundred percent, you know, because I think India is still early days, and uh, even though you have seen some bad performance by active funds, I would say, you know, I guess for the sake of this audience that's listening, you know, the relatively younger folks uh, looking to invest for a relatively long time, so have at least uh, between a twenty and forty percent allocation to passives, and this should be across categories. So if I think. Um, should be a bit of large cap and mid cap, I would say, and then also again, then obviously you can combine that with uh, some active funds and some debt. But uh, I think um, I think as the younger you are, the less debt you should have in your portfolio. So don't have like 60% debt and 40% equity. That's uh, have have basically like at least maybe 60 or 80%. I would recommend in equity. Uh, this is obviously, I mean, this is obviously if you have. Um, Um, if you do have short-term goals, then please, you know, have more debt. But if you have, if you're investing for a very long time, and if you have the risk uh, ability, then, and 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 if you know for a fact, and, and you should know that, you know, you will, uh, the markets do correct on and off, you know, every seven to ten years. So be prepared to lose, um, maybe between thirty and forty percent of your money. But obviously, the pullback is 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 very very short. So I'll give an example. You know, markets corrected in ninety two. Uh, the markets uh, pull back very quickly. Then 99, the Y2K markets corrected in two years' time. 2000, 2008, markets corrected in a year and a half. 2013, people just if they can just like manage their psychology, which I think is the most difficult part of being an equity investor. Then I mean, you will just absolutely do a great job. Number one. Number two, you know, I think this is I think extremely important. You know, I keep telling a lot of younger younger folks is. The the question that they ask me constantly is, you know, when do I invest? And you know, I think my response is very simple: as early as possible. 
you know if you can you know invest on the day you're born you know <laughs> you know because because yeah invest as early as possible you know i think the beauty about compounding or power of compounding and that is something of brain human brain is not really um does not have the yeah, capacity because it's exponential it's yeah, exactly yeah. exponential we don't have the brain capacity to understand the value of compounding and it is beautiful i mean i've seen it and the all you do invest so the money you invest today is going to double triple every single year in 15 to 20 years time every single year so and the earlier you invest the better it is you know so don't people ask me should i invest now should i force buy a car buy a house get married now like no don't do that invest today you know invest in yeah i i think even buffett has this story right so they asked him when did you start investing he said 12 he said what's your regret i wish i started earlier <laughs> so <laughs> exactly so Same and thing. and also you know if you've seen buffett's income grow you know at 60 you know he was not very wealthy like but the compounding effect of his i mean 60 to 90 you know his wealth must have grown some 100 i don't know how many x but uh, th- th- that's what right so the more time you spend investing the more um, the more that money uh, uh, is multiplying for you over time so trick is to yeah, start yeah i mean that. actually this is maybe this is a bad example right but i'm a huge fan of uh, bill gates okay i know he doesn't invest in equities but this guy is not even running microsoft and he's again on the rich list and he doesn't give a shit right i mean he's just do <laughs> he just doesn't care and he just keeps getting wealthy and wealthy because the machine that is microsoft like its exponential move has happened in the last 10 years right and uh, it's just it's beautiful yeah exactly so microsoft corrected a lot but then it's back now and i mean just look at his i mean he 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 was uh, wealthy in uh, 20 years ago and now just because of pure compounding he's again the wealthiest person so i think uh, and what he's done he's done, and 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 guess what you know bill gates has actually sold a lot of his stake over the last 20 years so bill gates would have been worth i think double of what he's worth today but he's actually given his money uh, money away to philanthropy so i think uh, despite giving i would say i don't know 20 30% of his wealth away over the last 20 years he's still like the richest person so i think that just shows you that you know doing nothing is the best strategy you know my job as as a as, as someone who knows something about mutual funds is is very difficult because you know i have to convince people to do nothing you know so, and 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 that's where most of my effort goes so which is why i think you know if you really like stick to investments and 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 don't like worry about the performance and you know whether it be active or passive it doesn't matter what what matters is that you hold on to whatever you have and um, yeah just 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 ride the yeah, wave yeah correct i i think all disciplines i think that's uh one thing we're taught i think in school is that if you work hard you'll get better marks but it's maybe just being really consistent for a really long time which in this case is not doing anything <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah yeah which is why you know i think people think that you know investing is magic and you know you have to like invest in these like only like uh, wealthy people make money and all that but you no know, that all that is not true what's a good stock to invest prateek please tell me <laughs> yeah <laughs> like Yeah, I don't know. yeah, I have. Yeah, I, I wish I'd known, but uh, I mean, I would have not been on this podcast if I'd known. You know, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there is, there is no good stock. You know, I'll be honest. People get lucky. Uh, the and and I have rarely seen people create great wealth using stock stock tips. You know, wealth making creating wealth is an extremely boring process. Very boring. It takes forever. You know, it's delay gratification. And if you're doing and you're having fun, you're probably doing it wrong. So there is no stock tip, according to me. Yeah, I mean the guy selling you the stock tips is exactly. The most yeah, yeah. So the, <laughs> you're just saying the house always wins. But anyway, yeah. So I agree. Um, I think stock tips are obviously. Um, so you know, I, I mean, most people do it because they have they like trading, which is fine. But uh, what I would tell investors is at least like you know have some corpus that you trade with, but have like maybe eighty ninety percent of of it that you invest for the long term. that is that is a good i would say compromise so don't give up trading if you guys if people like trading that's fine but don't let's like uh, don't don't like, i would say put 90% in in a vehicle where you can invest for a very long time and obviously then take your 10 15% and then that you can trade with and see if you can make money there yeah. thanks for saying 90% cuz i know inside you want to say 100% invest <laughs> But, yeah but thanks for yeah, saying yeah, i mean it's very hard to be idealistic i think uh, yeah, but but yeah. i think um, even even to a lot of um, i would say um, wealthy or hn i'll try to nice you know i tell them that you know put most of your portfolio in something as long something that is extremely long term and the rest you know you can invest in startups you can invest in structures whatever you want correct but i would say you know like discipline for 90 and then obviously then 
you can you can um, um, maybe experiment with the rest no thank you so much for your time that's a wrap you can find prateek on twitter prateek oswal you can find us learn app on twitter as well you can find zero dhar online uh, give us a shout out if you found this interesting thank you so much prateek for doing this man yeah thanks a lot this has been super fun thanks a lot mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully